Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 502, The Reaction to the Reaction to the News. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashland, and it's Monday, the 6th of May, 2019. Welcome to another show, and we're going to talk a lot of, uh, I can't even talk, there's no, nothing with words are coming out. We are going to talk about a lot of things today, but before we do that, you have a responsibility as the viewer and listener. The first thing we need you to do is like the show, share the sub show, subscribe to the show, and comment on the show. You can do that at YouTube, Facebook, wherever you see this uh, show on your feed, social networks, Twitter. Oh, and please retweet the show. That's your responsibility. Our responsibility is to be knowledgeable, transparent, newsworthy, and entertaining. Entertaining last, but it always seems to be first. We have but I started off this episode by saying we've been down this road before. And that either applies to the birth of a new royalty in uh, England, which is happening all the time now. You guys just, you get a big growing family. A uh, boy or girl? Boy. Boy. Well, no, no, we can't say that. Um, if you're talking about biologically, we can tell you. Okay. But we're not allowed to tell you what the gender is. We don't know sense. the gender, but uh, Harry and Meghan had a baby today. And uh, I know that because... Why chromosomes. <laughs> that's right. I know that because it's the only news being tweeted uh, by the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and USA Today. It's very exciting that we follow English royalty so closely. Uh, Kevin, I must object. The only things coming across my feet are still the aftermath of the Kentucky Derby oh, and the qualification and a 60 to 1 long shot uh, taking away first prize. Uh, that to me is more pressing news, but that's okay. just me. Well, if we turn to my email box, uh, the show we did last week uh, has caused a convention of anger and hostility across the Anglican communion. And so we need to sit back and discuss the reaction and discuss what some of the acronyms really are because we have new viewers and they have no idea what an EMEA is or what a CANA is or uh, they kind of figured out what an ACNA is and a GAFCON. We're just acronym city here. When I say we've been down this road before... You uh, brought some, uh, a cup of tea and perhaps... You got tea? Oh, just a cup of tea. There we go. <laughs> That's fine. Well, what, what's your favorite? Is that Earl Grey? What do you got? Uh, it's Yorkshire Builders tea. <laughs> oh, of course. You know, you're a little highbrow for Earl Grey, but, uh, you know. <laughs> well, I, what people don't know is we've, we've tried this show once and a half times already, and I'm getting hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> Since we pressed the record button about an hour and a half, we've all been to the bathroom. George just finished off his big uh, gulp from 7-Eleven. And, uh, no, no, no. My iced coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and I think I, I'm, uh, I'm out of coffee, so I'll be a little less hyper. On to the show. We've been down this road before. Um, George and I, in the early days, uh, I think it was 2011, we got in trouble. We had done a report on an organization called EMEA, which was a partner to the ACNA, and we said that there's some struggles in the leadership going on there, and immediately EMEA put out a press release saying how wrong we were and how evil it was that these two gentlemen could take airtime, and whatever you do, do not watch Anglican Unscripted, found at youtube.com forward slash Anglican Unscripted. That and we were lying liars who lied. Yes. <sighs> and should not, and we should apologize for being lying liars who lied yes. about the AMIA. And the AMIA was one story, and I, I remember sitting there uh, at a conference they had up in Amesbury. It was a uh, bishops of the ACNA at the time, uh, they had all 40, were sitting at a table, and Chuck Murphy, the head of EMEA, got up and gave his a bridge too far speech. We as EMEA cannot really operate as we need to operate as evangelicals here on American soil with Rwanda blood and Congo blood and the blood of Africa and the martyrs that have been there. We can't operate as evangelicals by being part of the ACNA. 
We have to be Amiya and pure Amiya. I, I was pissed. only th- <laughs> the only thing Kevin he let out was that he had found some golden tablets while visiting upstate New York. That's right. And uh, he had unfortunately had left them in the car, in the train state in the train, so he couldn't show them to people. But God was telling him that the purity of his movement had to be tied to the real purity of the church in Rwanda. And he therefore could not sully his group with the ACMA. And so I was a little upset at the meeting, and I told Chuck that, and Chuck assigned two of his bishops to take me out to dinner and soften me up. That's Kevin. He doesn't know anything. He's he's laity. We'll go soften him up. So I'm sitting there with Doc Loomis, and I forget the other bishop, and their job was there to soften me up, and I wasn't buying their BS. What and why can't you do that within the ACNA? Uh, and why can't you do that within the ACNA? Uh, I said, do you just do you believe in border crossing again? What what's going on here? And it was frustrating. And we've seen this type of thing where other organizations have built their own kingdoms and they don't want to give them up because they like the kingdom. They like what they built. I, as a business owner, I, I understand that the, that ethos. You build something, you want to keep it, you like it. But there's a heresy I want George to talk about here. Before I talk about the heresy, and I love talking about heresy and other people. (laughs) Kevin, how did that lying liars incident who lie turn out? Who happened to be right? Well, Who happened to have actually had the story? And while the other people who were raging against us for being lying and being malicious, who was right and who was wrong? I was right. You were right. We had our sources from Rwanda um, and Congo, and uh, within top, the organization, within the organization, and we knew what we're talking about. We, I would never have raised any of these issues if I had not have proper sources. I've got better things to do. I have more hair to lose than to sit in front of a camera and be wrong. So no, some we of our, have. Some what's of our that? viewers are going to ask the question. Is it possible you could be right twice in a row? Yes. <laughs> this is a hundred times. Well, yeah. you, you know that uh, pigs can fly too. Yeah. Uh, but I think I think the uh, people, I, I, those who have are quick to shout liars or to claim that there's malicious intent uh, behind what we do or say, um, you know, that's their right, good for them. But we have a track record now, and I don't think we've ever got any of these major things wrong. Yes, sometimes we confuse Wales and England that, you know, they, they slip places on the map. <laughs> but as to England. actually to the important <laughs> stuff, and yes, it's important to be able to tell the difference between Wales and England, but the really Stop important stuff, <laughs> the really important stuff, we've always had this right because we do our homework. Okay. Now, what Kevin is referring to is the, the same sin that was besetting the AMIA, the same heresy. And I'm using that word in its technical term, heresy. We're now seeing up a rising within this affair with Cana and the Church of Nigeria, the Anglican Church in North America. Uh, the sin is called the heresy. The heresy of philatism. What is philatism? Well, in 1871, I believe a uh, Orthodox Synod in Constantinople, a panel Orthodox conference. Uh, address the problem of the United States and Canada and also starting in Australia and other parts of the New World overlapping ethnic jurisdictions a Greek, a Romanian, a Bulgarian, a Russian, a Slovak, a Czech, Orthodox Church so on and so on and so forth all in the same place with, with overlapping territorial jurisdictions even though they shared a common faith and order there was no difference in the faith taught at the Bulgarian church as opposed to the Greek church. The difference was one was in Bulgarian, the other was in Greek, and they had Bulgarian clergy and Bulgarian bishops and Greek clergy and Greek bishops. Over 150 years ago, the Orthodox Church said, this is the sin of philatism, where you use ethnic, cultural, racial, or linguistic qualifications to set up jurisdictions over local cons- local considerations. So to have overlapping jurisdictions where there is no question of the orthodoxy of the other church, that is a sin. It is heresy. Now, we Anglicans, we've not had a uh, uh, ecumenical council for a good long time, 
So I guess technically we can't say it's a heresy, but uh, I, I think I stand on pretty good strong ground with the Orthodox here, and I believe them when they say this. Because what we're seeing with the division over Cana is that some of them more loud, they're saying that we need to be part of the Church of Nigeria because that's our true Anglican connection. Now, I was at Martin Minns' installation. He was consecrated in Africa, but he was installed in the United States. And I heard uh, the consecration service, and I heard the uh, Archbishop, I think it was Akinol, I'm pretty sure it was Akinol, it was, yeah. say that, you know, this is a temporary life raft until you guys get off the ground. The Church of Nigeria. It's, in other words, we're just like Rwanda, Uganda, uh, South Kenya. America, Kenya, yeah. all these places. Well, the Nigerians discovered a good thing. And they set up three dioceses, and they kept sort of a dual nationality between Acna and Cana. Now we have Nigerians in the United States agitating for a Nigerian bishops under a Nigerian church, not because the ACNA is failing in its orthodoxy, not because it doesn't treat, teach the true faith, but because its leaders are the wrong color. They're the wrong gender, they're the wrong, not gender, they're the wrong color, the wrong culture, the wrong ethnicity. This is the heresy of philatism. Now, this follows upon this same group of people consecrating a prosperity gospel preacher as a bishop. So, Cana has really got some orthodoxy problems in the sense that it is not teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we got these two incredibly foolish decisions that make me want to say, you know, what are you people thinking? Well, you should be happy with this, George, because they now, the Church of Nigeria and certainly these Cana dioceses, recognize you as more Anglican than, right. the, than Bishop Foley. You are more Anglican than the ACNA. You Absolutely. are more Anglican than GAFCON. I mean, if you want to look at the ramifications of this now, why is that, Kevin? Out, because I'm such a great guy? Or is it because I'm an Episcopalian? <laughs> because you're an Episcopalian. And they recognize the ACC more than GAFCON if they, if they uh, stick to the uh, tenets of what this document says. Now, but this philatism, uh, and Kevin, those two bishops who took you out, you know, I'm not surprised that they would do that because they're, after all, bishops that don't necessarily have to be particularly bright to be a bishop, just at the right time and the right place, it seems. Uh, but, these, but this heresy is one that is not just confined solely to race. Uh, I see this. When I lived in England, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I... Uh, I'm a conservative guy, and I heard about this English church organization called Reform, and they were having a meeting at St. Old Eight's Church, and I thought I'd go visit it. And I'm an Episcopalian, I'm an American. Every American clergyman, from far right to far left, wears one of these things, a collar. He may wear a tiny one, he may wear a big one, but wearing a collar is no mark of churchmanship whatsoever. It's just part of the uniform. So I went to this meeting of clergy at St. Old Eights for reform, and I was treated as, as if I were a Polish altar boy in bare feet, you know. In other words, the, un, the disobliging, unwelcome, because I wasn't wearing the uniform of a damp sweater and having the right vowels of, an, of a member of the English evangelical class. Now, I never went back uh, to the reform meetings, but that cultural assumption that we can only have people culturally like us running our church, that we can only have people the same color, the same ethnicity. It's not just a Nigerian or a Cana problem. I see this problem in the AMIE. Uh, I see this problem widespread. It's Well, okay, I live five miles from Yale. If you look at the square at Yale, there's a whole bunch of Catholic churches. There's a Polish, I think there's a French, I don't remember all of them, but there's, we well, used to live here. How, what uh, Polish church or Catholic churches are on the square? Well, I lived on this square, uh, and there was an Italian Catholic church on one, cor on one side, there was a Polish one and a Lithuanian one, and then there was an Episcopal church on the other one. The Episcopal church was heretic, so I never went there, oh, but <laughs> there were three Catholic churches, uh, to the three ethnicities who lived in that particular neighborhood of New Haven. They had different language. You could hear Polish Mass, a Lithuanian Mass, an Italian Mass, or you could hear a Latin Mass if you're really lucky at all mm -hmm. three. But they all had the same bishop. Same they were all the same members of the same church. Mm -hmm. The locality of 
of reaching out to people of the same ethnic background took place on the parochial level. Because when you up this into the Episcopal level, what you are doing is denying the, the charism of Episcopacy. You're making a bishop a club secretary. He's one, not your father in God. And one of the great difficulties we have in England, especially amongst evangelicals, is that there isn't any belief in Episcopacy anyway yeah. that sent Ecclesial um, understanding of, of as an identity of the church is missing. If it was there, it would act as a very strong safety brick upon the kind of tribal uh, tendencies that George has described, but it's not there. And so the, the tribal tendencies we have in England amongst Anglicans uh, have been refined to the nth degree so that you can, if you arrive wearing the wrong clothes, or, or actually, even to the extent of using the wrong cadences in your voice. Uh, you find you don't belong, your, your, your Christianity, your discipleship, your churchmanship, your existential authenticity is, is in doubt. And it's one of the ways in which we very seriously fail to be Christians and very seriously live out the gospel. And in terms of gathering together the fragments into, into, one, into one ecclesial orthodox unity, which ought to be our aim in England in the face of the terrible heterodoxy and heresy we're facing. It's heavily undermined by this tribalism, this clubism, uh, this this philatism in effect that you've been talking about. So the Nigerians may give expression to it in the way they've just done causing ACNA trouble, but it's a sin that besets many of us elsewhere. At the success of the ACNA, I'll call it the miracle of the ACNA in the United States, was they've now had two leaders in a row who have been able to overcome the forces of particularity, whether it be race, culture, class, Southerners, Northerners, uh, high church, low church, charismatics, Anglo-Catholics. You've had two men, Bob Duncan and Foley Beach, who have been followers of God to their church. They, in, they have the charism of Archiepiscopacy. The church has gathered around them. And uh, now, of course, they have to make compromises. They have to make short-term decisions to keep the ship afloat and going in the same direction. But they're working towards a common and godly end. And we're not seeing that in the situation on the ground in England, I believe. Um, well, I, I want to transition to England, but I want to make one thing clear about the document we're talking about where uh, the Church of Nigeria wants to have more control with Cana. Cana still gets the right, each of these three dioceses, to choose whether or not they stay in the ACNA. And I suspect Cana West will. I don't know about East. I suspect Trinity won't. Am I wrong there? Well, Bishop Dobbs, I believe, has said, now this is secondhand, that mm -hmm. he's staying with Agna. Okay. Um, Cana West is going to be divided. Okay. And Trinity is the non-geographic uh, ethnic diocese that is the source of the problem. So, of course, they're going to—I assume—they're going to go stick with Nigeria and abandon the ACNA. Yeah, I just want to be sure we get, we we have that clarity for our audience about the document we're talking about. Now, transitioning to England, you heard Gavin refer to and George referred to the English Welsh controversy. That's me. I started the last story in the last recording by misidentifying English when I should have said Welsh. There is a bishop from Welshland. How do you say that? What, 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 what am I prefer? <laughs> it's got to be Welshland. Welshland. Let's keep it. It's Deutschland, or uh, <laughs> who <laughs> wants to be sure she can get rid of any traditional clergy once and for all? Uh, who do not? If you do not believe in women's orders you're gone, and she proposed this to the diocese. Uh, what is the result of all that? Well, it's Archdeacon Peggy Jackson, the Archdeacon of Flandeth, which uh, well, is then. the diocese on the uh, south uh, western bit of Ireland, sticking uh, of Wales, okay. sticking to the Irish Sea. Um, she proposed, a, as you say, a motion to the governing body, which is the Welsh Synod that met in... Uh, uh, Cardiff on May 1st and the uh, synod essentially says that bishops may no longer ordain people who do not 
hold to the fullness of women's ministry, essentially closing the door to any traditionalist ever becoming a member of the clergy in the church in Wales again. Now, this was put up for debate, and there was a bit of a shock because the first 10 speakers said, this is malicious, this is offensive. Most of them, in fact, all of them were supporters of women's orders, but they essentially saying, look, we've won the war. We don't need to shoot the prisoners. Uh, so, and the motion was defeated, uh, but it was telling that two of the bishops, uh, Joanna Penberthy, uh, of uh, St. David's and Andy Johns of Bangor, uh, voted for it. Uh, they, oh, the woman bishop used to be Dean of Salisbury. What's her name? Uh, June, Os June Osborne? She, vo she abstained, as did uh, the Bishop of Swansea and Brecon, and the bishops of St. Asaph and uh, Monmouth uh, weren't there. So no bishop actually voted against it. Two abstained, two voted no, and two didn't show. Uh, but 60 uh, voted of members of the, leg, the lower house voted against it, so it was defeated. But it really was uh, a vituperative, malicious attempt to stamp out wrong thinking and not allow people who disagreed with Archdeacon Jackson's worldview to be clergy in the Church of Wales. It's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon, partly, as you say, George, because they've lost, they've won both the war and the battle. Already we hear uh, of, of beleaguered curates in conservative dioceses here who are told by their conservative or supposedly conservative bishops there are no future incumbences for them because of the views that they hold. So it's not just Wales where the battle and the war have been won. But I think one of the things that we ought to recognize is the way in which this is part of a left collectivism. This is not just a theological aberration. In the papers today, for example, there is a, a tax accountant who's been fired from her job the first person in England to be fired for saying that women who transgender are not biological women. She wants to make the distinction that I made jokingly at the beginning of the program between biology and gender, and she's lost her job. So she's taken them to a tribunal to see whether or not this is a sackable offence. It may be, it may not be, it soon will be for sure. But the, the problem the church is facing is that this, this collectivism which we see working out which we've called cultural Marxism, both in terms of, of, gen, of, of feminism, gay marriage, uh, transgenderism, soon, God forbid, paedophilia. This is part of a very powerful, secular, heretical movement that is sweeping through the church. And one of the things that the church has failed to do is to call it out for the sub-Christian heresy that it is. This isn't just about misogyny or about differences on, on gender. This is so much bigger than this. It's a virus or a spirit which is sweeping through the church worldwide, but, it, but it's found particularly uh, particular underbellies in England and the USA. And it's really tragic that Anglicans are so theologically and culturally unaware that they've adopted this, this movement, which is a, a collectivist, absolutist movement upon which totalitarian can, can be built. Um, and it, it, Gavin, what your point is equally pertinent to people who call themselves traditionalists or conservatives, that their lack of, they don't add fontes, they don't go back to the sources. Yeah. They don't understand where we have been, where the church has been, where these battles have been fought, where these issues have co-risen. So that, I, I mean, I'll see comments from perfectly well-meaning people say, well, isn't it just lovely that like people of a like culture can come together and worship together in their home language while they're in a foreign country? Yeah. That's not the issue. The issue is placing nationality above church as the defining mark. It's, it's making a form of secularism, or if St. Paul would say, a, ma a matter of the flesh. And but it's the same logical processes as you described of saying, isn't it lovely that this nice person, who may be perfectly lovely, shouldn't they be treated fairly and uh, uh, be, a, be allowed to get married or be a priest or... Uh, this evil person who's not uh, towing the line, shouldn't they be fired from their job because they're making life difficult for people? So at root, this is flesh versus spirit in terms of the mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, it oh, now, these are uh, different levels, of course, of, of uh, uh, venality, uh, but they arise from an, an the most poorly educated group of people, theologically speaking, that I know are the clergy that I meet. Um, because most of these people, most of us, 
were educated a long time ago in a land very far away among what's very trendy at the time. And we haven't had the time to crack a book ever since. So uh, my generation was the very tail end of the Boltman and the German existentialists yeah. and Paul Tillich and all that crap, if you will. And so these poor people who are now my age in their 50s and 60s, they're going into the world with a theology that was dodgy at the time, but is now thoroughly exploded. And they have no tools in which to respond to the challenges of secularism, of cultural Marxism, because they don't have the foundations of the tradition of the church that have sustained it for 2,000 years because we threw it all away. I Should I get off my high horse no, now? Or I, think, I... I think it's time we transition to Anglican politics. I read uh, yesterday... Now we can really get upset. Now we're going to really have some fun. <laughs> Let me crack my knuckles. Um, I read that Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has been dethroned by the ACC for being able to choose who is and who is not Anglican. And I thought that would be fun to talk about. Uh, George, what is the story? Oh, uh, well... There's nothing new under the, uh, as Ecclesiastes says, there are no new things under the sun. Uh, at the close of the uh, ACC meeting in Hong Kong, after some of the conservatives had left, because they always leave early. Why these guys do this, I don't know. But Welby had a press conference where he apologized for not taking into consideration the feelings of the gay spouses not invited to Lambeth 2020. In other words, this is... Uh, another inconsequential climb down from Justin Welby of what the tenor of the conference was and what the uh, import of what they were trying to tell him. Once the people leave the room, he gets to determine what is, is. And it's now, oh, I'm sorry that I was mean and not inviting the gay spouses. Um, well, there it is. No, uh, there it is, but uh, about the dethronement. He, he, of he did this at the Lambeth primates meeting. Oh, where did. the Lambe Changed you know the where, where you know the, the primates came to an agreement, they came to a deal, and then Oko left early, and uh, who was it? Uh, uh, left early. Eliud Wabakula left early, uh -huh. and uh, I think uh, Munir Nice uh, was Venables. out the door. Yeah. Venables, they all left at mm -hmm. Catch Plains. They were basically sick of English food and weather. And in the press conference, you've got the Archbishop of Hong Kong who happens to be a member of the Chinese Communist uh, Party's administrative group and uh, is an enemy of pro-democracy, but that's another story. And Archbishop Tabo Makoba of South Africa and a Josiah Wadawu Farone, three, people, uh, three uh, people of the establishment and the hard left who are interpreting what happened and basically underdoing what all was agreed to. This is standard operating procedure. He who controls the microphone at the press conference sets the course of the news not what actually was decided. I was uh, also talking about the dethronement of who gets to choose who's Anglican and who's not. Uh, at the beginning no, of... No, that's us. Don't, we have that. We get to choose who's Anglican. We choose. Gavin, you're Anglican. George? Kind of. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> although, although, referring to a previous conversation, which I won't... I won't <laughs> yes, still... Don't divulge anything. <laughs> Uh, our people in North America were very worried about the things they think I believe that I've never expressed any views on. So the, the, who's an Anglican and who isn't an Anglican seems to be a, a matter of private opinion. You know, I for some of our viewers, it's a pity we yeah. can't get a full body shot of Gavin because some of them believe he has like a rosary hanging out of his side <laughs> pocket. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's just... It, um, it's funny, uh, because Gavin is independent-minded, he scares people because he's not uh, a go-along, get-along sort of guy, and therefore if you can't control someone and the stakes are high, you fear them. And Gavin, unfortunately, is uh, scares some people because he won't do what he's told. It'll work its way out. Oh, um, it, it, I have authority yeah. over me. That, that's, sure. Although I won't, I won't think what I'm told to think. That's yeah. true. Anything else we need to talk about, guys? Oh, yes. We, we, we started on it, and then I interrupted with some inane comment. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think we want to talk about how ecumenical agreements are now decided. That's right. Yeah. Who gets to decide. And uh, we also wanted to talk about uh, the uh, 
some of what arose out of this meeting in Sydney as it pertains to right. the situation in England. Well, let me, let me touch on the uh, one thing that I thought was amusing. Uh, ecumenical agreements, in other words, like the Archic movement, Anglican Roman Catholic International Consultation, discussions with Methodists, Lutherans, the Orthodox, this, that, and the other, all had a certain pattern. We would have these committees appointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and it would be overwhelmingly composed of English, and, and, and then they would have third world academics, which meant from Ireland, on uh, these teams. And uh, then they would come with up an agreement, and these agreements would then be brought to the Lambeth Conference and the bishops at Lambeth. The gathered church in its representative bishops would then take on board, is this something we see as consonant with the faith that we, as we understand it, and it would prove, move through that to be received by the Anglican world. That's how we did it up to 98. 2008, uh, Rowan Williams, to hold things together, stopped all votes. So we just talked. We didn't vote on anything. Well, at the ACC meeting, the head of the Interfaith Dialogue Desk at the ACC said, it's been 20 years since we've been able to agree on an uh, inter interfaith document or an ecumenical document because the Lambeth Conference is basically no longer doing this. Therefore, we should do it. The staff and the executive committee of the ACC. Yay! And the ACC said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so now some unelected, unappointed, unknown desk officers in London, plus a uh, committee of a body which Justin Welby says has no voice on doctrine, now gets to decide what doctrine is according to the ACC. So the yeah. ACC is just as corrupt as it was when we were there in Jamaica. Now they have less money to throw around, but less yeah. Money. Just, just as corrupt. corrupt. Yeah. What a clown so show. We have, we have to find an insult for the Scots. You 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 brought the Irish in with the third <laughs> third versions. We root the Irish. From my point of view, we really need to be even handed with the Scots. I'm sure we'll find something for the end of the program. Give it time. <laughs> give it time. We're, we're we're on a roll today. Um, the other, well, we are going to talk about the situation in England. Um, uh, Gavin and I and Kevin were engaged in a bit of Kremlinology after the release of the latest GAFCON primates meeting photo. Now, what is Kremlinology as it applies to the Anglican world? Well, if you remember the good old days, you could tell the relative power and uh, prominence of the, the various Soviet hierarch, uh, hierarchs. Or if they were even alive. <laughs> where they stood on the podium in Red Square mm -hmm. next to Stalin or Brezhnev. in other words, Brezhnev, Khrushchev, where they were. That works with Anglicanism as well. Where are you seated in the group photos at Lambeth? Where are you in relationship to the General Secretary of GAFCON and who was there and who was not there in the photo? So when the photo comes out, we get out our little spy glasses. We're like doing photo reconnaissance. Uh, and I notice that, uh, where is Andy Lyons? Andy Lyons, the bishop in charge of the AMIE, he's missing. There's Michael Nazarali. There's Susie Leaf. And here's uh, Charles Raven. But where is the guy who's supposed to be running the show, AMIE? And what, what this was actually held where he's having a sabbatical too, right? It was held in Sydney, mm -hmm. and Andy Lyons is in Sydney, and okay. Andy Lyons is missing from the photo. Mm -hmm. And I so I wrote to Gafcon, and I said, where's Andy Lyons? He said, oh, well, he's still on sabbatical, but he'll be back in June. Uh, now, I'm speculating, but uh, I doubt it. Yeah, um, we'll to see. Well, let, let's, let's look at the signs, and this is criminology, where you can speculate about anything to your heart's desire, and if you're wrong, nobody will know. Uh, they'll never open the archives. Um, the problem in England, as we have expressed it, is that there are varieties of churchmanship, but they're only allowing one form of it to be expressed in leadership. Mm -hmm. In other words, AMIE is the, as I called them earlier, the damp sweater brigade of the evangelical movement. There are no Anglo-Catholics, there are no broad church. I mean, it's a very particular slice of the Church of England. And if you look in the photos, you do not see any representatives or any attempt or any move to broaden 
the AMIE so that it becomes a second ACNA. Charles Raven's a staffer. Mm -hmm. Michael Nalza Alley is a retired bishop. Susie Leaf is an administrator. You don't see any of... How should I put this without being offensive? I've already been offensive, so I'll say it. The players. The players, yeah, sure. You don't see any of the people of consequence within the English opposition there. You only see the staffers. And the man who should be there is missing. Mm -hmm. So what does this tell me as a 20-odd year observer of these, of these political games? Something's going to change. Something's, uh, something's got to change, is what you should tell you. And it would be very good if, if we managed to avoid replicating the sin of the Nigerians mm -hmm. in ACL. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, Gavin, I, I don't ha you have to be politic because that's your world. And you can make enemies. <laughs> Me, I've made them all years <laughs> ago, and I don't need to worry about it anymore. Uh -huh. but, it, but, it, but I think part of the, but this comes back to the. We, uh, I mean, I labeled the Nikana problem one of phylatism. Um, but it's, again, not unique uh, based on culture or race. Um, we see it church party. Um, we see this in the situation in, uh, in, on the ground in England. The, and, uh, the nano divisions are, are without limit. I think we should say, too, that one of the exciting developments has taken place, and the, the proof of the pudding is going to be in its eating or what it leads to is the movement of Dr. Peter Sandlin from the Church of England into the Free Church of England. A number of people have given this a lot of publicity and hope, are hoping very much that this will be the beginning of one of the movements, uh, that it will have two, two characteristics. One is that it will encourage other people to leave the Church of England and show it can be done. Uh, and then the, our second characteristic is that obviously for those for whom the Free Church of England is, is the right port of call, that it will be in a, uh, an even more attractive venue for people like, like Peter Sandlin. Mm -hmm. He's been given a lot of credit for, uh, for taking a courageous step. It is a courageous step. Uh, the next step is going to see whether or not uh, it can inspire other people and whether it can do what George has suggested needs to be done, and which I agree with, and that is to provide a way of drawing uh, a width amongst the orthodox rather than a narrowness gentlemen this has been a fun program i don't know if we've pissed off more people i hope not but uh i know there's an organization down the road where in one year two year three years george and i are going to be somebody you hate dearly it's just the way this works we're a very transparent show we are Ooh. true believers we don't sweat it if we make you sweat it's just it, it's our nature and uh, yeah, may i point out that uh, uh, for about 25 years whenever uh, someone disagrees with something i've written without fail someone will send me a particular passage of the bible saying you should come to them in private before you criticize them. yes there's that uh, so I, i've heard that so it's not going to be particularly an effective way to change our minds well, the, the longest email complaint I got this week was not about what we said about Nigeria, not about the whole circumstance of what's going on. It was about the fact that you used a cuss word in describing a bishop. What's and it? so I have 14 paragraphs on George saying the word jackass. And you may have a number of English people writing to you asking to explain <laughs> an acronym which they're not familiar with over here. Yes. Uh, what I'm going to do in the show notes, I'm going to put some of the acronyms that we've talked about today in. Um, well, Kena, Amia. And know. the other one you used was BS, I think. <laughs> BS. <laughs> well, you know, uh, not people, Bible study. Uh, people. Uh, <laughs> What can I say? Jackass is not a swear word or a cuss word. It's actually in the New Old Testament. Just saying. Well, well, I was I referring to them as Balaam's ass, where they were speaking Just the saying. word of God, though Just through the lips through the lips of a uh, of a donkey. All right, let's close this out. It's been a long forty five minutes for some of our our, our oh, the people. Know. Well. The, 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 the people I feel sorry for the most are the ones who work at 815 and who are paid to listen to us just to see what's going on on the other side, or the people at Church House who have to listen to us you know, just to be sure that uh, you know they know what's going on. I, I'm sorry, guys. 
I didn't mean to go a whole 45 minutes. It's just a newsworthy week. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted episode 502, the reaction to the reaction, and presumably the next one will be a further reaction. <laughs> a reaction to the reaction to the reaction. Mm-hmm.